All right. Thank you, everyone, very much for coming. Okay. My name is Eric French. I am at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, as well as University of Cambridge. And I, my job, I think, is to say a few thank yous. So first of all, thank you to everyone for coming to uh, help us discuss these important issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, in the UK, the persistence of income across generations is high. There's some evidence that it's actually been increasing over time. Furthermore, parental resources appear to be increasingly important in terms of the well-being of young adults. In terms of, for example, it appears that parental resources are an increasingly important uh, determinant of whether young people are, purchase homes. So we've assembled an excellent team at Institute for Fiscal Studies, largely a set of excellent young scholars um, who've been trained uh, either at Institute for Fiscal Studies or, or who have been associated with it. And in terms of my second uh, thank you, I'd like to thank the uh, Economic and Social Research Council, who has funded both uh, this uh, discussion today as well as the training of lots of these excellent young scholars. Some of them have moved on to different universities around the world. Some are at Institute for Fiscal Studies doing great work. As part of this project, we have uh, produced, uh, I believe, six working papers. We'll tell you about some of the research that has come out of this. And the key thing that, that we always try to make important at Institute for Fiscal Studies is you know, tightly linking important policy questions with rigorous academic research. And I think that the research that you're going to see today really highlights uh, the importance of that. The final job that I have is to tell you that we have lunch. Um, so just in terms of what we have, uh, I believe after uh, at around 12.30, um, it'll be back where you got your coffee and things like that. So we'll keep you well provisioned for today. Um, and so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the leader of Institute for Fiscal <laughs> Studies, uh, Paul Johnson, who's going to tell you a little bit more about some of the bigger goals of this underlying project. Well, thanks very much, um, Eric. Uh, I'm, um, I'm both going to give a little bit more of an introduction to the day, but I'm also chairing this um, fantastic panel that you see in front of you, which is the start part of the day. As Eric says, this is part of a, or the, uh, not quite the end, but uh, uh, the culmination at this point of a lot of work that's been going on, largely funded by the um, ESRC, on uh, intergenerational mobility, particularly focused on wealth. But it's also a part of a much bigger set of uh, work that we've been doing over you know, many, many years at the IFS on inequality and mobility. And in particular, over the last three years or so, of course, we've been taking forward the Nuffield-funded uh, Deaton Review of Inequalities, which has looked at all of the sorts of things here and drawn very much on this program of work. Um, we've got uh, three sessions today, the, the first one which I'll introduce um, in a moment, and then sessions on uh, particularly focused on housing and then particularly focused on the taxation um, of wealth. I think one of the things that uh, led to this work was, I think, a sense that um, there's been lots of work on income mobility and rather less um, on social mobility as determined by wealth. Uh, increasingly um, good data has allowed us to do uh, a lot more on that. And as you'll see, uh, income and wealth, as you'd probably expect, are fairly highly correlated. Kids with high incomes tend to have parents with high wealth, and that, uh, as you'll see, um, exacerbates the lack of uh, social or economic mobility uh, that, we, uh, that we see. Um, the result of this is that I, um, I, I'm, I'm in increasingly frequently and boringly um, seem to be uh, saying possibly the most important thing people can do nowadays is to choose their parents wisely. Uh, it's, uh, it's increasingly um, important. The, the, the relationship between uh, parental um, wealth and parental income and uh, children's wealth is m much bigger than it was uh, for, for my generation. Um, those born in the 80s with high wealth parents can expect to get something like a third of their uh, entire uh, lifetime resources 
um, from inheritance, far more uh, than those um, even with well-off parents from a generation before. This is incredibly important. And actually one of the, I think, big findings, maybe not findings, but one of the things that absolutely pushed home to me as a result of all the work we've done uh, as part of the Deaton Review of Inequalities is that wealth is becoming far more important in determining um, social and economic opportunities uh, 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 and mobility over time. So that's by way of introduction to this whole, um, this whole piece of work. As, as Eric said, um, a, a significant number of um, outputs uh, already, uh, mostly focused on uh, these issues around housing and wealth uh, transfers down the generations, and you're going to hear a lot of that as we go through the day. For this first session, we're going to be focusing um, on social mobility and the role of wealth, but not, not entirely uh, on wealth. We're going to have Uta Bolt, who is an associate at the IFS and also an uh, associate uh, assistant professor at Bristol, um, who's going to be talking uh, particularly about um, earnings and wealth, uh, earnings and um, social mobility. We've got David Sturrock, who's been um, you know, fundamental to setting this thing up. So thank you, David, and also with Eric for leading um, all of the work that you're going to be, or a lot of the work you'll be seeing today. He's going to be talking about wealth um, uh, inequality down the generations. And then we've got, um, so there's, there are two um, presentations, and then we've got um, Karen Rowlingson, Karen Rowlingson um, from the University of York, Sam Friedman from uh, the LSE. Now, they are two uh, honorary non-economists who are uh, here um, to um, uh, give a slightly, um, uh, slightly different uh, perspective. And then Joe Blandon from the University of Surrey and the CEP, um, who has done, uh, and all three of those have done an enormous amount of work on social mobility. So we're looking for 15 minutes each for the presentations. Um, five to seven minutes or so for each of the discussants, then <coughs> we'll possibly have a little conversation between ourselves and there ought to be plenty of time uh, for questions um, and discussion from the audience. So I will stop and the, um, let, the, let, the, let the main event begin. Okay, so thanks very much for having me here today. My name is Uta Bolt. I am a lecturer in economics at the University of Bristol and associate at the IFS. And today I will talk about what drives intergenerational persistence in the UK. So intergenerational persistence measures how strong the relationship is between individuals' earnings and their parents' earnings. Okay, so if there is a strong relationship between your earnings and what your parents earned, it means that there is a high intergenerational persistence in earnings, and that means that there is low social mobility in earnings. Now, in the UK, we have a particularly high uh, intergenerational persistence. So this is a graph that I've stolen from some of Joe Blandon's work, and so here we can see a comparison for different countries, um, and so we can see differences in intergenerational persistence and earnings, and we can see that the UK really ranks relatively highly. And this is in comparison to, for example, Denmark and Finland, but also places such as Canada or Australia. So in this particular piece of research, we were especially interested in understanding the, the drivers behind this intergenerational earnings persistence in the UK. So in other words, why do high-income parents have high-income children in this country? Now, there are many potential reasons for this. First of all, children from high-income families might attain more years of schooling. They also tend to have higher cognitive skills. During childhood, they receive more investments, both in terms of the time that the parents spend with them but also in terms of the quality of schools that they go to. And finally, overall also, they face quite a different family environment. So their parents tend to be more educated and they tend to have fewer siblings. And so understanding how much each of these channels matters is important because it tells us where policy can most effectively intervene. 
So to do this, we used a data set called the National Child Development Study. And this data set is a very unique cohort that was born in one particular week in Britain in 1958. So almost all children who were born in that week are part of this survey. And they were initially studied at birth, so at age zero, and then they were followed throughout their lives up until today. And this data set is great for the purposes of what we want to do, because first of all, we have information on the earnings of the parents of this cohort when the cohort members were children. Then we have information on the cohort members themselves, so we know what they earned throughout their life cycle. And lastly, we have a lot of information on the potential different drivers of intergenerational persistence in earnings. So looking at this data, we can see the following. So here I'm showing you some of the gradients between those coming from richer versus poorer families. So here what we did is we split the sample into those coming from the bottom quartile of the parental income distribution and those coming from the top quartile of the parental income distribution. So the darker shades are those who grew up in poorer families, the lighter shades are those who grew up in richer families. And so what we can see first of all is that those who grew up in poorer families are less likely to continue their education beyond compulsory schooling age. Turning to cognitive skills, we see that those coming from the poorer families also have lower attainment when it comes to math scores. So here, what we're plotting is the fraction in each group that attained a math score above the mean. And so we can see that for those coming from the poorer families, this is only around 35%, whereas for those coming from the richer families, this is around 58%. Then we can also see that those from poorer families tend to receive less time investments. Now in the survey, we have lots of different measures of time investments. For example, we have a measure of how interested the parents are in their children's education, but we also have a measure like this. So at age seven, the parents were asked how often they read to their children. And so we can see that those from the richer families tend to have mothers that read to them more often. Turning to school quality, here we have a measure of the fraction of pupils at the cohort member's school that continues education beyond compulsory age. And so we can see that those from the poorer families are less likely to go to schools where everyone else then continues on beyond compulsory school age. No, tech is letting us down again. Well, what I can tell you in the meantime is that this data set, which we've used a lot for our research uh, at the IFS, is, is a really unique data set that you know, is particular to the UK. And what's really special about this data set is that we have combined these early measures of childhood and later life outcomes. So there are, for example, surveys in the US which have been running for a long time, but a lot of these studies only start with, for example, teenagers or young adults, meaning that you can't capture exactly these types of things, like how often did your parents read to you? And this turns out to be pretty important. And that's why this is a particularly nice data set uh, to use for studies like this. Anyway, so I can continue now. So here, this was the last um, chart that I was talking about. We can see that for those coming from poorer families, uh, th those coming from poorer families usually grow up with more siblings as well. And so looking at this chart, we can already also think how these channels might interplay with each other. 
right? So it might be that if you look at, for example, the family background here, if you grow up with a family with lots of children, it might be that your mother then has less time to read to you. And this is something that we really wanted to understand in this research, how much, how do these um, channels affect each other in generating intergenerational persistence that we observe. So to do this, we used an approach called mediation analysis. And this mediation analysis helps us to understand both the direct effect and the indirect effects of each channel on lifetime earnings. So here, if we, for example, think about school quality, we might think that school quality directly impacts someone's lifetime earnings. However, we might also think that going to a better quality school means that you will attain more years of schooling in total. For example, you, have, you might have teachers that motivate you to continue to higher education, and that then impacts your lifetime earnings. You could even take this one step further and think that school quality affects your cognitive skills, and thus the uh, years of schooling you complete, and thus your lifetime earnings. And so what we do is we evaluate for these uh, different direct and indirect uh, channels how much they matter. So just to illustrate this graphically, so here we see that parents' earnings are likely related to family background, which we measure as parental education and family size. It might be related to investments, so time investments and school quality, cognitive skills at 16, and years of schooling. Now, in the first level of our analysis, we focus only on the direct effects that each channel might have on the child's lifetime earnings. In the next level, we then allow for indirect effects via years of schooling. So here now, cognitive skills doesn't account just for the direct effects of cognitive skills on child earnings, but we also account for the indirect effects via years of schooling. So cognition might increase years of schooling and thus lifetime earnings. Then we add another level where we allow for indirect effects via cognitive skills. So investments and family background might also operate by affecting cognitive skills. And finally, we allow for a last level where we allow for indirect effects via investments. So then let me get to some results here. So overall, we explain 54% of the intergenerational persistence in earnings. Okay, so we don't explain 100% because there might, of course, be other channels that link parental earnings to child earnings, but we explain quite a good chunk of that. And this is using these four channels, education, cognitive skills, investments, and family background. Now, this breaks down into 10% coming from years of schooling, 33% coming from cognitive skills at 16, 14% coming from investments, and almost zero coming from family background. I should mention here that the effect of years of schooling and cognition is quite precisely estimated, whereas the effect of investments in family background uh, is not so precisely estimated. Now, what happens if we allow for indirect effects via years of schooling? Then the picture changes. Then we can see that the effect of cognitive skills becomes much larger, whereas the effect of years of schooling almost, well, actually even becomes negative, okay? So here what we can see or how to interpret this is that the differences in years of schooling that matter for intergenerational persistence are actually largely explained by differences in cognitive skills for those coming from rich and poor families. Then once we allow for indirect effects via cognitive skills, we find that investments actually matter a huge amount, okay? So investments are now up 
to 47, explain up to 47% of intergenerational persistence, whereas the effect of cognitive skills has become much smaller. Again, this means that the differences in cognitive skills, which are important for intergenerational persistence, are actually largely driven by differences in investments between different families. And then finally, once we allow for family background to affect investments, we find that investments then contribute to 32% of intergenerational persistence and family background to 19%. So the effect of family background becomes large once we take into account the effect that families have on investments and thus cognitive skills, thus education and child earnings, okay? What's important to mention though is that the share explained by investments remains relatively large, even though we've accounted here for differences in family background. So this indicates that differences in investments aren't fully explained by differences in family background. So there might be some direct relationship between parental earnings and investments, for example, driven by financial constraints, which really matter for the persistence that we observe. Now for women, the patterns are largely similar. For women, we explain slightly more. So for women, we explain 62% of intergenerational persistent, persistence. But we can see that once we allow for all the indirect effects, again, investments and family background is really what's driving uh, the persistence that we observe. So let me conclude here. So for both men and women, uh, schooling and cognitive skills explain large shares of the intergenerational persistence and earnings, but the effect of schooling is entirely explained by cognitive skill differences and cognitive skill differences in turn are largely explained by investments. And so differences in investments between high and low income families are really key to intergenerational persistence. Now in terms of implications, what does that mean? Well, it means that we might want to think about policies that reduce gaps in childhood investments between higher and lower income families, but it's also important to ensure that education is accessible because what we saw before is really for this particular cohort, differences in educational attainments were largely driven by cognitive skills. So if you had higher cognitive skills, you could get higher education, which would lead to higher earnings. So we want to ensure that co this continues to be the case. So thank you very much, and I will pass over to David. Thanks, Ita. Okay, thanks everyone very much for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, bringing together a range of research that we've been doing, looking at social mobility in a time of high wealth levels. And this is drawing on work with a number of different IFS colleagues. Wealth grew much faster than incomes across the second half of the 20th century and first part of the 21st. Here's the growth of national income, but far outstripping it particularly since the 1980s, was the growth in wealth. Now, um, Ian Mulhern and others have shown that that's probably come down a bit in the last few years, but we're still living in a world in which wealth is much higher compared to income than it used to be. There's a generational slant to this. Uh, on the left-hand side here, I'm showing the fact that younger generations, those of working age, have particularly seen their incomes stagnate in recent years. So um, what I'm showing here is median household incomes for those born in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. What we see is that looking at the most recent ages, which is the most recent years for each of these generations, income growth is flattening off. So those born in the 1980s, in fact, have seen the first part of their working life with no higher earnings than people born 10 years before them. At the same time, 
wealth of the parents of these generations has continued to grow or is uh, much greater for those who are born later. So on the right hand side, I'm showing the evolution of wealth of the parents of each of these generations with age. We see some ups and downs as house prices have gone up and down. But the thing to take away is these large differences. For example, the parents of those born in the 1980s being about 20, 25% richer than the parents of those born in the 1970s. And this raises questions about uh, the influence that wealth might have, what might happen when it's passed down. So we've seen this big picture trend, but why might we care about wealth in the context of social mobility? So thinking about things, first of all, from the perspective of the child's generation, Uta's talked about the persistence of earnings, but we know that beyond earnings, there are other financial resources that people receive that contribute to what they can uh, spend over their, their lives. There are intergenerational transfers of wealth. There's also the returns to wealth, and these are likely to be reflected in people's wealth held at any given point in time. So it's not a perfect measure, but in some sense, it's a closer proxy of their total lifetime resources. There can also be direct benefits of wealth itself. It can confer security um, against um, shocks. It can also, potentially for those with very high wealth, mean influence over political processes. And finally, thinking about this from the perspective of the parental generation, wealth is also something which, has, which is particularly easy to pass on to, to kids and might be a particularly good means of transferring advantages down the generations. So with all this in mind, we've looked at the following questions. First of all, how much does your wealth depend on your parents' wealth? And in this case, we're using survey data which allows us to look at those who were born in the 1970s and 80s, when they were in their 30s, um, and look at how their wealth related to the wealth of their parents. We also then look forwards and project the impacts of inheritances to be received in the future on social mobility for these generations. We then ask, what is it that drives intergenerational wealth persistence, particularly looking at the early part of adult life, which we might think is particularly important? And then finally, I'll turn to look at the implications of the growth of wealth or mobility of those from different ethnicities and from different parts of the country. Intergenerational wealth persistence is high in the UK. Uh, so in this chart, I'm going to show you one measure of this. So what we do in some data that we have is to rank all of the parents uh, from not to 100 in terms of their wealth within their generation. And here we're talking about wealth, which is housing, financial wealth, uh, less debts. And then here in the dots, I'm showing the average rank of their children, uh, the children being ranked within their generation. And we see the steady linear uh, pattern. On average, each rank higher that your parents are in the wealth distribution amongst their generation, you'll be 0.37 ranks further up in your generation. And that rank-rank relationship is quite high, comparable to the US, much higher than many European countries. We might be interested not only in the average position of children with more and less wealthy parents, but also we can ask, well, are you particularly likely to get to the top or to fall down to the bottom, depending on where you start in life? And in this chart, I'm showing the distribution of these young people's wealth in their generation. So the probability, for example, of getting to the top in pink or the bottom in red for people with parents in each fifth of the wealth distribution. And what I want to highlight is that it seems that having wealthy parents is particularly important for getting to the top of the wealth distribution. So quite a, a stark difference, 5% chance if your parents were in the, in the least wealthy fifth. Um, about uh, more than 30% if you're in, in, in the wealthiest fifth. And that contrasts with the bottom, uh, where that's a sort of more equal opportunities uh, outcome, um, getting to the bottom of the wealth distribution. So, so far, I've been talking about wealth um, observed when people are in early adult life, uh, in their 30s. That is, in almost all cases, before substantial inheritances are received. 
And because, um, in part of the trends in wealth, inheritances are projected to grow quite rapidly um, over time, they have been growing for some decades, expected to continue to do so, roughly doubling in size between the 1960s born and 1980s born generations. And that's due not only to subsequent generations of older people being much wealthier than their predecessors, um, but also because they are having fewer kids. And that wealth is passing to children who are not seeing such strong growth in their earned incomes. So as a result of this, um, when we put all of these pieces together, inheritances are projected to have an increasing negative effect on income mobility when we're thinking about lifetime income, all of your resources, earnings, and wealth transfers, and so on. Um, we estimate that for the 1960s born generation, inheritances increase that rank-rank relationship between your resources and your parents' resources by 19%, but for the 1980s born generation, that rises to 26%. And that comes on top of what we already know is declining social mobility across uh, these generations in terms of earnings. So what is it that's driving this persistence of wealth, particularly now looking again at early adulthood, um, a stage of life that's you know, where, where kind of careers are set and things could be quite um, important. So the first thing to say is that, as Uta has shown us, there's strong persistence in earnings across generations. So we would expect that to drive persistence in wealth. But that's not the only thing that's driving wealth persistence. So here I'm showing a similar chart to before, but now I'm showing the equivalent relationship between the rank of parents in terms of earnings and their children's rank in terms of earnings. And we see that that rank rank slope is not as steep for earnings as it is for wealth. So 0.27 compared to the 0.37 that we found for wealth. So that tells us that there must be something else going on driving additional persistence in wealth above and beyond the fact that earnings are persistent across the generations. So we can think about a few different channels um, first of all, thinking for parents that are similar earners, why might those who have more wealth have children who earn more? And then for children who are similar earners, why might those who have wealthier parents build up wealth more quickly? We see that those who have wealthier parents tend to earn more and to have higher levels of education. That's probably not very surprising. Um, what we find Further to that is that if we compare those amongst people with the same uh, earning parents, those with higher levels of parental <coughs> wealth, as shown by the green line, earn substantially more. And this seems to be mainly a difference uh, in terms of having parents at, at the top. So understanding further how it is that parental wealth might directly impact your career trajectory is something we're looking at in further work at the IFS. So turning to now, once children's, uh, taking children's earnings is given, why might some build up more wealth than others, and why does that vary by your parental background? First of all, those with wealthier parents do just tend to save more of a given amount of earnings. Again, that's true even when looking at those with the same, same earnings level. That could be because of um, attitudes and things that they pick up in, in early adulthood. It might also be due to interaction with some of the next um, factors that we're going to go on to look at. Um, so people are choosing to, to save more. Um, they're also receiving larger amounts in wealth transfers from their parents. So they're kind of most straightforward in some ways channel. In this uh, chart, for this piece of work, we were able to split people into different groups according to the um, a measure of economic status of their parents. So we have parents who didn't own their own home, those who did but didn't go to university, and those who went to university and owned their own home. The latter group are much more likely to receive substantial financial transfers uh, through their 20s and 30s from their parents. Over an eight-year period, about three times more likely than the, those with renter parents. 
And those sums are also more substantial for those with richer parents and driving increasing gaps in terms of resources between those with richer poor and poorer parents. That said, the size of these wealth transfers by itself is maybe not huge. Even for this richest group, it's about 3% of the other income that they receive from earnings over the same period. But what could be particularly important is if these transfers have knock-on impacts for other decisions. And one way in which they might do this is through investment decisions, which in turn might impact uh, wealth accumulation. And what we know is that more than half of these wealth transfers are reported as being used for home purchase. And there, we see really quite dramatic gaps opening up between richer and poorer parents, uh, those of richer and poorer parents, as people move through their 20s. Here I'm just showing the home ownership rate for three different groups by parental wealth. Again, these differences hold up even when we're looking at children who are earning the same amount. So that's not what's driving these differences by and large. Um, and the next session is going to dig under the surface of this a lot more and also think about its knock-on implications for wealth accumulation. Similarly, those uh, with wealthier parents also tend to invest more in stocks and shares, a risky form of investment which has tended to have high returns. So it seems that there could be this knock-on in terms of your returns to wealth and therefore wealth accumulation, um, amplifying the impact of initial transfers. So finally, just before I wrap up, what does this changing picture in terms of wealth mean for different groups? First of all, we see that low upward earnings mobility for some ethnic minorities is likely to be compounded by low wealth transfers from their parents. So here I'm showing the probability of receiving a wealth transfer over a two-year period by different groups um, of young people. Those from Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds receive wealth transfers uh, with about a third, at, at about a third the rate of those from white British backgrounds. Um, and that come along, comes alongside the fact that we know that those uh, from those minorities from poorer backgrounds already struggle to move up the earnings distribution. There are big regional gaps in wealth. Um, and as wealth has grown across the generations, we might expect this to have growing consequences. So here I'm showing for people born in the 1960s that, for example, people with parents in London had parents who could give them about three times more uh, in wealth, potentially, than those with parents in the Northeast. But as we move across the generations, we see that these gaps in wealth, uh, in parental wealth, between those living in, say, London and the Southeast, and those living in the other parts of the country have really expanded. And again, we might pick up on the implications of this and its interactions with choices about where in the country to move, the ability to move to high uh, income parts of the country, like London, for example. So I'll just finish there. The implications of this research, for understanding social mobility, we see that wealth persistence is high, and it's not all driven by earnings. There are these other important factors that could mean that it's going to be increasingly difficult for some groups to earn their way up the lifetime income distribution, particularly those from some ethnic minorities and from lower wealth parts of the country. So for policy, that means focus on education, and equalizing those early life outcomes is, of course, very important, but by itself is not going to equalize uh, wealth accumulation amongst those from different parental backgrounds. And it seems, as we'll pick up in the next session, um, that the interaction of parental transfers uh, and housing markets could be a key um, thing to understand and where policy might have a role to play. Thank you. Sam, no, then I don't Karen, trust you. To, um, no, that's fine. Put their thoughts on all of this. Very happy not to be trusted. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Uta, and thank you, David. Um, it's really, um, really great for me to have the opportunity to respond to these because these both are areas which really feed in, well, are very closely related to work that I've done. So I'm just going to build on a little bit uh, um, Uta and David's talks with a few observations from my own research, if that's okay. Um, 
So the main thing I think we take away from, from Uta's talk is that education and skills are an important driver of intergenerational persistence. And we've also seen the role of, of investment both through par from parents and through the school systems in, in, in driving that as well. I mean, this is, this is really, gr I love this paper because it's so similar to something that, uh, well, so similar. It's a very high tech version <laughs> of something that we did uh, some years ago back in 2007. And we did that on the, um, on the same cohort that Uta talked about and also a more recent cohort um, from 1970 with the same sort of setup and layout and I'm mostly going to be talking about that data. And what we found, um, what we found in, in our earlier study is that 85% of the fall in intergenerational mobility that we observed between the 1958 and 1970 cohorts can be explained by this strengthening of the relationship between parental income and educational attainment broadly defined. So including some of the measures of skills of early life skills that, that Uta talked about there. So it really emphasises the importance of who gets access to education and how, that, and how that feeds into these stories of intergenerational earnings persistence that we're talking about here. And of course, that really um, heightens any kind of thoughts that we've got about what happened in, in COVID, uh, where actually, I mean, it was a, we had a small improvement in the extent to which poorer children were able to keep up with their richer, uh, children from richer backgrounds, say at, say at age 11 and age 16, that was improving for about 10 years, and then all of that improvement was lost. Um, now, how much, you know, there's a bit of a balance here when we talk about that, because what we also see from Uta's work is that a lot of what's going on there is things that we can't control, um, things that parents do in the home, um, but clearly those differences were really marked out in the pandemic when children were much more kind of in the home and had much less input from schools. So I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind that we're at a tricky stage uh, when we talk about some of these stories. Um, the other thing that I really noticed when I was looking at, looking at Uta's slides is that there are some important gender differences there, which she didn't get a chance to talk about really. Um, and that's something that we're kind of following up in, in other work um, with my colleague, Lindsay McMillan, uh, which really focuses on these gender differences in intergenerational persistence and looks across the life cycle of what happens uh, between, um, for men and for women. So the, the story that Uta was telling was, was that all at 33, mostly? Uh, this is over the life cycle. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. So, so you sort of, oh, you were putting it all together, yeah. I think, yeah. So there's less emphasis on changes, perhaps, it, it, certainly in the work that you presented today, uh, whereas we focus a little bit more on that. So when we look at what's happening for, um, people in this BCS 1970 cohort, um, what's kind of quite interesting is that we see a big difference depending on whether you're looking at monthly earnings or something which takes account of the fact that women generally work a bit less than men. Um, so there's two kind of stories here. One is that when you take account of, um, of how much women work, the intergenerational persistence looks a little bit lower for women. So some of the reasons why women's earnings are similar to their parental income is because women from richer backgrounds tend to work more. Um, so that's a story that's not really been thought about too much. And another story that comes out of this is the fact that as men get older, you see an increased um, persistence between their earnings and their parental income. So they seem to be able to capitalize on the gains that they've had early in life in a way that women don't so much. So there's a couple of stories there that's kind of, that are kind of quite interesting, I think. And the other thing Uta mentioned very, very briefly is that her models are able to explain a little bit more about why um, women's earnings persist um, more than is the case for men. So there's this kind of slightly larger unexplained bit which doesn't come through um, education and skills for, for men compared to women which makes you kind of wonder what's going on. So that's something we've been thinking about a little bit. And there have been, I don't know if you've been following, that um, Claudia Golden um, received the Nobel Prize for looking at women's earnings recently. And one of the things she emphasises is what happens when women go into the labour market and the kind of jobs that they select into, uh, this idea of greedy work, she calls it. So there's greedy work, you know, employers, especially at the top end, are greedy. And men are prepared to, wow, men are prepared to go for that in a way that women aren't. And this can make a big difference to women's earnings. Um, so we try to understand a little bit more about whether these job characteristics could explain. So moving a little bit beyond the point where people enter the labour market. 
And we did find that for both men and women, if you look at these dots, they're kind of, you're, you're moving um, down here. So if you look at the diamonds, that's kind of rough, the, the diamonds, well, no, we're going a bit beyond the diamonds. So we're going, we're going down, sort of, we're not actually adding very much with the last two dots uh, beyond what Uta was kind of talking about. So we're not able to explain too much more, which again emphasises the importance of these early skills. And even for... Um, women, these job characteristics only explain a little bit more once we get really into the nitty-gritty uh, occupation. I don't know if you can see those. They're very faint, actually. The last uh, line there is actually controlling for occupation. And what we're not able to do here is explain more about why there's this direct effect from parental earnings to, um, to men's, um, men's earnings, um, which is kind of additional for men compared to women. So that's something that we're continuing to work on. But I think it's a really interesting point, which I don't think Uta got a chance to talk about too much, about the fact that there are differences here between men and women. And what happens in the education system is them changing a little bit once people um, reach the labour market. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to say about Uta's talk. I'll just check the time. It's, oh, my goodness, terrible. Um, so there's just a couple of points there. On David's, I'll, I'll cut this shorter because I think it'll feed in a little bit into what's coming in the next session. So David and his colleagues have investigated wealth, co wealth correlations and transfers in some detail from those born from about 1974 onwards. And in work that we've done, um, we really focused on this idea of, of wealth correlations through the lens of home ownership and housing wealth. And what we find really backs up what David talks about. Um, in terms of the fact there are very strong links between housing wealth and um, home ownership across generations. Um, but this seems to have grown, um, which, the date, because David's data is much more detailed, he wasn't really able to, br well, a little bit in some places, we weren't able to bring out all the trends, which by focusing on home ownership, we were able to a little bit more. So I'll just show you these statistics very quickly. So one thing that um, David certainly talked about in terms of wealth is the incredible differences in terms of the wealth experienced and, and held by people of different age groups and in different cohorts. And what this first chart here is showing is how much the home ownership rate has fallen among young people over cohorts and how much it's increased for generations that would be their parents. Um, and what this has led to is there's been a big reduction in home ownership for people at age 42 comparing... Um, people in 2000 and in 2012, um, and that fall has really occurred most for those people whose parents did not own their own home. And that's why we think that this has really fed into some of the um, patterns in wealth inequality that we've seen. Um, and kind of raises this question that while we tend to talk about relative um, differences very much, the absolute differences make a big difference as well. So the absolute um, experience of people coming into the labour market, the number of people owning homes, as an important implication for, um, for um, mobility. And just one final chart. Uh, this is something that we looked at, again, on this issue of absolute mobility. If you can see the gold line there, what this is showing you is the share of people who, in absolute terms, were, had incomes higher than their parents at the same age. Showing this for lots of countries, but the gold line is for the UK. So whereas in the past we may have worried much more about relative mobility, where you are in terms of the rank compared to your parents, we now have an increasing concern about the absolute levels of mobility, about the real chances of young people, both in the labour market, the housing market, and in terms of their overall incomes. So hopefully this sets us up for a good discussion as we go through the day. Thank you. I apologise for everything. Thank you. So the evidence is clear that people with wealthy parents are more likely to do better in life than others, even after controlling for a range of factors, and this limits equality of opportunity. So what can we do about this? Well, perhaps we could look at education policy, and that's something we can pick up in discussion perhaps, but I think we've heard from a range of speakers that that could only play a relatively small role. And in any case, I would argue that wealth inequality is not just a problem due to social mobility. It's also a potential threat to democracy, 
and to having a well-functioning economy and to environmental sustainability. So how do we tackle wealth inequality given the range of problems it presents to us? I think we need to tackle it from both ends, from the top of the wealth distribution and the bottom and also the middle. Um, so at the top, and Sam's talked about the top here, it, we could in terms of policy response, which is what I'm going to focus on in my um, seven minutes, is look at tax. That's obviously an important vehicle and there's a session on this later today, so I won't talk too much about tax except to say that public support for higher levels of tax on high levels of income and wealth is actually much stronger than sometimes politicians will say. Um, I think you've got Dan Goss talking later, I don't know if he's here already, but um, Dan Moss have done some very interesting work on this. So there is public support even for raised inheritance tax, not abolishing it as it seems to be the discussion with policymakers at the moment. Also what's clearly very popular among the public is cracking down on tax loopholes, tax avoidance and tax evasion among the very wealthiest. And yet, what we see is that the number of HM revenue and customs investigations that result in prosecutions has fallen by more than two-thirds in five years, with just 11 wealthy taxpayers prosecuted last year, those with more than £2 million in assets. I don't know if there's anyone from HMRC in the audience who's willing to declare themselves. <laughs> but if you are, um, I think you need greater clout and more resources to tackle this. It would be popular and presumably would pay for itself. But given the session later today, I want to say something more about those at the bottom of the wealth distribution. What can we do to support people to reduce their debts, their negative wealth? We haven't talked so much about that yet, um, but also help them to save uh, and have some positive wealth. And I hope that these kinds of policies would also help those <coughs> different ethnic groups that David mentioned, that we don't focus on perhaps enough, and perhaps if there was a different speaker here, we might even be talking about wealth reparations. And in the US, there's a very lively debate in, on policy around wealth reparations. But thinking about um, debt and negative wealth, the main reason that people have um, high levels of problem debt in the UK is that they have to run a deficit household budget where their necessary expenditure exceeds their income. So there is no chance of saving, and actually it's very difficult to even make ends meet. So we have to look at benefit levels, wage levels and security of income to ensure people have a minimum income level from which they can meet both their current needs and hopefully save at least a little. Income is only one side of this, of course. Costs are a major factor. And I know there's a session looking at housing shortly, but I, I would hope that we won't forget looking at renting and the cost of renting, particularly in the private rented sector. How can we reduce the cost of rent and support people with housing costs better? Perhaps we can do something around tax here with thinking about more progressive council tax or other kinds of housing wealth taxes, uh, but also council tax benefit, which was cut 10 years ago. And so now people are having to pay council tax, which they haven't or didn't have to before those, those cuts. And that's causing a lot of um, financial strain and council tax debt is, is, is very high. So if we could sort out incomes and, and costs, people would have a little bit more money where they could potentially choose, make that choice to save. But we could also look at particular savings policies. And if we go back to 1997 and the new Labour government, there was much talk of asset-based welfare. And the government then piloted a saving gateway. That was abandoned by the coalition in 2010, but then reincarnated in 2018 by this government with its help to save scheme which offered a 50% bonus up to a maximum of £1,200 over four years for those on lower incomes. The government initially hoped it would benefit about 3 million people, but only 350,000 accounts opened since 2018. Nevertheless, um, many of those people saved more than they would have done otherwise. The government was going to actually end that initiative uh, in September this year, but gave it a reprieve until April 2025. And the Resolution Foundation, I think there's somebody on the panel later in Resolution Foundation, their work suggests the government could boost Help to Save rather than abandon it by auto-enrolling all new benefit claimants, all those on universal credit, into an account with a small bonus to kickstart their incentive to save. And they could pay for this by reforming ICES, which cost over £4 billion per year in tax breaks, with over half of this amount going to people with more than £100,000 in their ISA accounts. So they could cap the total amount someone could save in an ISA to a you know, pretty modest 100000 
and then easily afford to uh, help those um, through help to save much, much more. Another new labour asset-based welfare policy that was abandoned by the coalition was the Child Trust Fund, which sought to generate a capital sum for children when they turned 18, which actually has just recently happened. I think it was about 2020 the first children turned 18. Now, research recently published by Stephen McKay and colleagues shows that there was £10 billion saved in these funds by 2022, and the researchers have also compared those children with Child Trust Funds with those who were either too old or too young to benefit from the scheme. They found that children from better off families benefited the most in absolute terms from the scheme, but children from poorer families also gained from the policy. Indeed, most would have had no savings at all without it, but managed to accumulate some on top of the government initial endowment. So I think it is worth looking at discrete kinds of savings policies to help people to save, and we could afford that through, refund, uh, through reforming the tax breaks we give, we give to people with higher levels of wealth. And I haven't even mentioned the support we give to people with large pension pots, which the government boosted further in this year's budget. Finally, because I'm running out of time, I've talked about the top and the bottom. What about the middle, the squeezed middle, as sometimes called? Well, median incomes are no guarantee of financial security. And while I haven't got time to go into thoughts on policy here, Loughborough University is carrying out some work with, for the Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust, which is reporting in January, so I would watch out for that one, and they're going to be talking about the problems of financial security of people on middle income, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all. What, what, what an enormous amount of um, incredibly rich uh, information and presentations there. Um, we've got about half an hour. I mean, I just wanted to sort of ask a couple of questions before I throw it open to the very keen audience members. Um, uh, I mean, I mean w w one question that's um, for um, U Uta um, and or Joe, really, is about this issue of parental investment and, and how incredibly important that looks. And you know, in, in some specifications I've seen, it appears to kind of completely wipe out the effect of parental income or background. I mean, do you take that as sort of a hopeful sign that this is something that it's it, it, you know it, it's something that is malleable? It's um, you know you, we we have an unequal distribution of income and so on, but we know that if you make those investments, it makes a difference. Um, or do you take it as an unhopeful sign in the sense that that's a really hard thing to um, change? I mean, from a personal point of view, I do remember sort of seeing this type of work you know, just before I became a parent a long, long time ago now. And um, I mean, the message I took away was it was not good enough just to be, you know, relatively well-off middle-class person. You actually have to do stuff with the kids. Um, which, uh, but but it's, it, I mean, w would either of you like to kind of comment on, you know, does that make you hopeful or unhopeful about, uh, about opportunities for progress? Yeah, so there is definitely evidence that you can change parental investments. And the important thing is what I called investments here is twofold. So we have parental time investments and we have school quality. So school quality is quite obviously something that the government can invest more into and thus improve cognitive skill outcomes, but also in terms of time investments, especially nowadays when a lot of uh, children spend a lot of time in childcare, improving, for example, this uh, quality of childcare is, uh, could also be seen as a type of time investment. So this time investment doesn't necessarily just have to come from the mother or the father, but it can also come from other sources. So yeah, to me, I would be quite hopeful here. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to add to that, which I think is completely right, is there is increasing research on how you can get parents to increase their, the quality of their investment. And I know former IFS person Sarah Catan is, is working on that. Um, as well, so things like, you know, can you use apps to prompt parents to engage with various activities with babies? Um, can you, um, you know, all those kind of, those kind of things, can, can um, someone coming into the home in terms of a, a fa what they call a family nurse actually promote good um, interaction? So I think people are quite aware of this now and are looking increasingly 
at, at both things that can be done outside the home and also things that can be done inside the home. I mean, there's no doubt, though, it's worth commenting that if you're financially struggling, it's very difficult to make these kind of investments. So, you know, stress is quite important as well. So the kind of stress that people have been under in the cost of the living crisis, we can't completely say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. It's all about investment because that feeds into, feeds into investment a lot. Sam, that, 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 was, that was fascinating. Um, I'm pleased I'm part of the 0.05% is in <laughs> who's who, but, uh, but, I think that's, um, but I think that may also reflect some um, uh, backward lookingness about who's who, because I got in there when I was a director in the civil service, which I think maybe a generation or two ago was a pretty you know, powerful job, but is uh, definitely not quite so much anymore. But, you're, um, uh, but, but I was just wondering whether you, how much you know about, I mean, is, is it true internationally that the top 1% or whatever, the, the, the very wealthy, are just very different in their attitudes to, to, to risk and life, or is this a specifically British thing? Do you, do you have a sense? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I, I don't know uh, is the short answer. I think, um, I mean, I think here we, we, this, was, this was kind of just us trying to understand the mechanisms uh, uh, and doing that more through the, the sort of qualitative inquiry and trying to sort of excavate, I think, some of the some of the ways in which um, extreme wealth um, kind of produces a particular type of person. Um, and I think, you know, it is obviously a very distinct element, you know, when we look at some of these broader trends. The sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has this concept of distance from necessity. And I think there's a kind of interesting element that you can sort of think about in terms of what that looks like in terms of the, the sort of time and space freed from economic urgency to kind of um, to think in all sorts of ways about, about how you sort of shape, shape a person in such a way that um, allows them to, to progress in these, in these very particular ways. Um, but it, I don't have a huge amount of insight, I think partly because of the kind of methodological issues that we came up against of, of, any other, of anybody else looking specifically at this kind of positional elite and then how wealth uh, shepherds there. Did you, did you get any sense of how this is mediated by going to the top public school? Yeah, very, yeah, very strongly. Um, there's a whole chapter of that about that in the book. I'm looking I, forward to the book. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think you know, we we certainly have, um, uh, uh, you know, we have all sorts of tiers of eliteness within the private education system. We were particularly interested in the Clarendon schools. Um, you know, Eton, Harrow, St. Paul's, and, and, and interviewed a lot of the kind of the old boys that had been through that system. Um, and again, I think what you what you see there is often, which you know, which you can link to wealth, right? Because they're very expensive schools to, to go to in the first place. But how there's often a sense in which what those schools are doing is actually sort of finding what you're good at, <laughs> and 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 sort of um, sort of making you feel that 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 talent, that thing you have. Is something to be you know cultivated, um, and and but the, what that thing is can actually be perhaps much more multifaceted than than it might be in in the state system, um, where there's not again the same kind of time and space to devote to to the particular individual, but that that sense of of, of kind of um, uh, specialness, if you if you will, um, we then shows up later in people's narratives about how they. Um, explain how they've got to where they've got to and particularly actually interestingly when you we, we wrote about kind of different notions of meritocratic legitimacy and what you found often you know which you know the meritocratic sort of notion of hard work and talent often among those sorts of individuals there was an emphasis in obviously mediated by by humility that you don't say this explicitly but that that they got to where they got to on the basis of more like talent rather than no, absolutely. Um, David, one thing that comes across in a lot of this is just the absolute centrality of housing um, and the big difference it makes if you can get onto the housing market earlier, if you get a bigger deposit. I mean, that sort of, it, it builds on itself. You, you need to pay less in interest. You have a more expensive house, which, um, which, which grows more. You pay the mortgage off earlier. I mean, I mean how, I mean, Presumably, you would agree that housing is absolutely at the core of a lot of this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the, one of the reasons why we've got the, the next whole session on that. So I don't want to um, take too much of the material from B, who's going to be telling us a lot more. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, as, as Joe was pointing out, we've got this uh, strengthening over the generations and the relationship between whether you're a homeowner and whether you're, your parents are. And it seems there's quite a few channels through which becoming a homeowner can be important for your wealth, at least in the decades that are kind of underlying the data we're looking at, there are obviously big periods of capital gains on, on housing. So if you even got in there kind of five years earlier, that could be pretty transformational for your wealth. And we saw in the data that it is true that people from wealthier backgrounds are getting on the housing ladder earlier. Um, but V's gonna talk more about this, but there's also other channels um, whereby because of the nature of the housing market, first of all, a little bit of help can actually have quite an outsized effect because of these constraints on the deposit. Um, and also whether if you, if you bring down what you're paying in interest, that's a pretty sizable outgoing for a lot, of, a lot of people, so it can be very important too. And Karen, you talked about a, a set of things that one could do. I mean, it is quite easy to get a little bit depressed listening to some of this analysis. <coughs> the scale of the inequality, the scale of the lack of mobility, the scale of the sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the way that the 1% behave, um, the poverty at the bottom just feels almost overwhelming. I mean, do you have, I suppose, to what extent are you optimistic that um, the scale of policy response that could really have an effect is possible? Um, and indeed, do you have a view as if there's one thing you could do, what, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. I, I Absolutely, this is possible to tackle. It absolutely is. There's, there's loads of levers we can use. I mean, there's loads of research. So um, the, the commission that's uh, on the wealth tax, and you might hear about that later, huge amount of research around different kind of approaches to wealth taxation. Um, we, we, I think we know what we can do. It's having the political will to do it. And I think that takes some political courage. Um, because I think actually a lot of this is popular which is why it's always, to me, a bit of a, a surprise that some politicians don't argue more strongly for this, because I don't think it's a vote loser in a way that some politicians think it could be. I think there's a lot of um, anxiety amongst our political leaders around this, although some have, um, you know, obviously Labour and opposition have said they'll change non-DOM status and tackle that. I think, um, I think Kistama said he would reverse the pension breaks that were increased in the budget. So there are there's some signs there, but things like... Um, capital gains tax, increasing that to be the similar level to income, it's a no-brainer really, isn't it, in terms of popular support and it makes sense and, and so on. So I think there are lots of policies um, that we could do and would be popular. Uh, it just needs that political courage. I don't know if there's one thing. Uh, <laughs> it's so hard, isn't it? Um, I hate it when people ask me that kind of question, <laughs> sorry. No, I, I, think, I think probably I'd go for something at the bottom end if after, because even though I I'd want to tackle the top and it all matters, but actually, when you think of levels of debt and poverty, I would want to look at tackle um, levels of universal credit. That would be my, um, my ask. It would cost a lot of money, but um, it would make the most difference to people on the ground, and I think that, that really matters. Great. Uh, we've got time for some questions. Oh, a, 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 forest, a forest of hands. Um, let's take, we've got three at the front here. Should we take these three just as a group, and then we'll come back? Mohammed Amin, my question is for Uta, and I was particularly struck by what you said about the impact of family investment on cognition at the age of 16. And coming from a very poor background, I attended a free state nursery from the age of three, and I'm aware of the benefits that gave me. Now, countries which you had on your slide vary very much. Have you sp looked at all at how countries' provision of free nursery education from the age of three and even free creche provision earlier varies by the level of linkage between inequality <coughs> that you found on your figures? Have you looked at that? Great question. Uh, could you give it to the chap next to you? Yeah, um, Michael Percy. Um, apart from... I suggest that uh, we might like to revert to CTT from IHT, which is, a, well, I know IHT is a big issue for um, the Institute of Physical Studies. Um, on education as well, um, I, uh, the, the investment of, of family, I think, is the most important aspect. My father was not a high earner. He was a teacher, and I went to one of the finest schools in London. I think that's the basis. What I was going to ask about is, do you feel that the Labour Party policy of, of taxing um, 
uh, independent school fees to be a sensible way, since I think this is likely just to increase the gap, will make independent schools even more exclusive. And on that basis, we will find what I would like to see, instead of means blind, capability blind entrance to the finest schools. Okay, thank you. And if you could pass that to the lady behind you. Francis Coppola. Um, I was interested, Uta, in um, the fact that you cited the um, a study that started in 1958. Um, I was born in 1960, and I remember what the education system was like at that time. Um, and it was very different from the education system now. For example, far fewer people went to university. So I'm a little concerned that despite all our efforts to reform education over the last 60 odd years, we still have high income persistence. Do you have any idea where we're going wrong? Okay, great set of questions. Um, uh, I'm not gonna ask everyone to uh, answer those. I mean, I'll, I'll take the question on independent schools. We've done some work on the, 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 the key point about independent school fees is that they've doubled in the last 15 years with no effect whatever on the numbers of people going there. I think if you look at any, um, any impact on, on this, it's likely to have very little effect on the numbers of people going to um, independent schools if you add 20% through, uh, through the VAT system. The, school, the, the independent school system has itself decided to remain the size that it is, but it's become much, much more expensive. And so I think you, that, that would be the, you know, the basis on which uh, my colleagues, Luke Sabietta and others, have, have looked at their, the likely impact of increasing fees through the VAT system. And their, their view is that overall, some schools will struggle, overall the impact's likely to be fairly limited. Um, on the, um, uh, so there's a couple of questions, I think, for, for ask Uta and um, Joe to answer on. It's a question of the role of free nurseries and, and, and how that has an effect. Uh, and also, um, you know, 1958 was you know, quite a long time, even before I was born, <laughs> um, and the world has changed um, quite a lot since then. Partly, what can we learn by looking at 1958, and you know, given the expansion of education, why have things not got better? So Uta first, and then Joe, and then I'll go back to the audience. Yeah, so in terms of the free uh, nursery provision, so really w there is a lot of evidence that shows that good quality nursery provision makes a big difference for people's both cognitive skill development as well as non-cognitive skill development. So there have been interventions where lower background children, for example, were sent into programs where they were provided with a lot of stimulation especially, which then improved a lot their cognitive skills. And if you remember the graph that I showed you on the first slide, where we had different levels of intergenerational persistence for different countries, you can actually also see that a lot of the countries that have low intergenerational persistence, like for example Denmark, like for example Germany, are countries that at a very low cost tend to provide high quality free nur uh, high quality nursery um, education for children. Yeah, shall I just follow that up? Because I've actually looked at the, so if you think about the, what's happened in UK policy after the nursery was available for some local areas, you know, quite, quite a long time ago, sorry. Um, it was then spread out in the uh, late, late 90s, early 2000s to cover many more children. And that's actually something that I looked at using administrative data, thinking that this was going to have a big boost to social mobility and this would be really, really a great policy. And actually, the results were a little bit disappointing. Um, and I think that's because many of the um, children were already actually accessing that. And what actually happened was that the, there was just a movement in transfer between who was paying from the parents to the state. So it was a little bit disappointing. So it seems that with these early years policies, the devil's a little bit in the detail. And I know IFS have highlighted a lot um, that the detail of policy is, has, has got a lot worse. Because now to access your full provision, you need to have parents who are working 30 hours a week. So actually it's become more unequal in terms of what children are getting. And the fact that the um, funding is quite low has meant that perhaps we're concerned about the quality of what children are, are receiving. So there's a little bit of concern that early years policy in the UK is kind of moving in the wrong direction in terms of uh, encouraging social mobility. Just one other thing about education and, and, and 1958, if it's okay, Uta, is yes, that was quite a long time ago and there was a huge expansion, particularly in higher education since that. 
Um, somewhat depressingly, that seemed to be taken up most by children from slightly richer backgrounds. So it, in fact, increased uh, intergenerational immobility, um, as, I, as I think I mentioned. So again, you know, it very much depends. It, it's quite an intractable problem. Um, so we do need to think carefully about how we act on, on these issues and be mindful of some of the stickiness in the system, which tends to mean that parents from richer backgrounds tend to be the ones who take advantage of these things first. And it's in, very much in line with what Sam's talking about here. You know, there are certain people who always seem to manage to push their children to, to having the things that you need um, to, to get on in life. Great, thank you. Um, let's go towards the back of the room this time. So the gentleman there, the lady there. Thanks. Uh, it's Nathan Long here from Hargreaves Lansdowne. I was really interested in the, uh, the comments around wealth, and I wondered if you'd managed to extract anything around whether there's almost a social norming. So you talked about investments in stocks and shares. We've seen quite a lot of research that suggests a lot of people don't think investing is for them. And I wonder if there's kind of that trickle-down knowledge through the family, what kind of impact that has, because clearly there is a norm around home ownership, but less so around the financial assets. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm uh, Donna Carmichael, a PhD student at the LSE. And my question is mostly for David, but others uh, would, could certainly chime in, is about the Wealth and Assets Survey and the relationship of wealth as defined by the WAS and social mobility. So the Wealth and Assets Survey is composed of five different asset classes, as, as I'm sure you know. Uh, real estate, property, business assets, um, financial assets, uh, physical assets like art and cars, and private pension. So there's a lot of research which looks at the distribution of wealth by category of asset and shows that the top, you know, 1% uh, or even 10% uh, have a different composition in terms of the asset classes in the Wealth and Assets Survey. So have you tried to correlate social mobility with some of these asset classes and not just kind of the total wealth, much of which is affected by real estate uh, uh, escalation in values? Okay, and then the man next door. Uh, thanks, a question, a comment. The question is about a threshold at which wealth has an effect. David mentioned wealth as security. And I remember the late lamented John Banner doing some work which showed it, it was an incredibly low level of capital that you had that had a dramatic effect on the ability of the family to make decisions uh, which gave them greater freedom. And I wondered if there's any sense of that type of threshold that gives you security. My, my comment is about education. And by the way, thanks for saying 1958 is such a long time ago for those of us that were uh, rather predate that, but still. Uh, about, I'm all in favor of e every effort to equalize initial education, but both on the gender aspect and on adult education, there are limitations, it seems to me, to what you can do to equalize uh, equalize the outcomes from initial education. The gender, because it shows that women's competencies and skills are under-rewarded, so we need to look at the, the actual way in which employment operates, something I've written about non-quantitatively. But also, I think we need to look at adult education opportunities across the life course. And I wonder if your studies had any evidence on the impact of later educational opportunities on uh, mobility and wealth. Okay. Um, Sam, do you want to take uh, uh, anything on that? I mean, do, you know, do we know anything about attitudes to wealth and investing from any of your work or on, um, on, on sort of levels that really start to make a difference? No, I, again, I don't, not necessarily, the, to the question about this sort of attitudes towards investing, I, there is some work, I think it, it's, um, uh, Mantoft in Norway, Hanukusela in Finland, where they look at almost the kind of the sort of per, um, financial education that comes through elite families in terms of a particular attitudes towards um, stewarding and accumulating wealth, um, and I think that 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 probably is a key, is a key factor in in the sort of uh, wealth reproduction at the very top. Um, but, it's, but it's, quite, it's quite focused on that very elite group. That's all I probably 
we say that in the current. So I think there is, has been some work in University of Bristol on attitudes to investing, and particularly if we go back to the sort of squeeze middle or middle, actually maybe a bit more than uh, out the middle, but um, and it just shows that people don't, it, they do put lots of money into cash savings and perhaps who could and should um, put money to investment um, mm -hmm. policies. So the Money and Pension Service have been very interested in this and trying to think about how we can support people because if, if you have... No, if you're in debt and you can get access to free advice or citizen advice, you know, step change. If you're at the top, you can afford wealthy, you know, wealth management services. But if you're kind of in that middle, getting ad advice which is affordable um, or seemingly perceivably affordable is a, is a challenge. So I think there's some research at University of Bristol. So I want to pick up on the wealth effect. And I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but in America, Michael Sheradden did a lot of work on the asset effect. And you're absolutely right. He, his work showed that a, when we talk about relatively small amount of wealth, we're talking a few thousand for people on very lowest incomes can make a, a difference in terms of well-being and feelings of security and so on. So I think that there is a kind of threshold. I think it's also interesting to look at a threshold at the top. You know, what, where is the tipping point at which wealth inequality is, is particularly problematic if we're looking at things like democracy or yep. economic functioning and so on? And Ingrid Robbins in, in the Netherlands, a philosopher, has been looking at this and coming up with a philosophy around... Um, limitarianism, is there a limit beyond which it's dangerous for democracy or dangerous in terms of the economy and so on? And I think that's quite an interesting um, kind of research that, that's, that's going on at the moment. David, do you want to say something about, um, about wars? Yes. Uh, so, so on the kind of point about different types of wealth and what's going on here with kind of transmission of maybe um, getting involved in the stock market, uh, this is something that we looked into a little bit and others have looked into too. And uh, we actually found, uh, maybe surprisingly, that in the UK, um, it was, there wasn't really much evidence that you know, if your parents, given their level of wealth, were more invested in stocks, that you would also be. It's just, so maybe it's not a sort of attitudinal thing, at least in that context, as much as a wealth in general uh, means you're more likely to invest in stocks. But I should say, evidence from other settings um, has, has found different things. So I know one study in Sweden um, where they actually compared, so they looked at the relationships of these participation in all sorts of different assets and savings across the generations, and actually compared uh, how that was for people who were um, adopted kids versus uh, biological kids. Um, so first of all, there's strong correlations across the board um, in the participation in the stock market and savings rates, but they're just as strong for people who are adopted, so the interpretation there is, you know, there's not some innate uh, preference, which maybe most people, uh, other social scientists that are not economists would reject anyway, um, but it's about the early life, um, uh, uh, early life environment that shapes um, what you do, and that really accounted for a lot of the, the persistence of wealth in, in Sweden. Um, and maybe one other thing to mention is also the evidence, particularly in the US, on the very high concentration of entrepreneurial activity and and business ownership amongst the real top 1%. So that wasn't something we really got into in, in the UK, but it, it is something that's known to be going on, yeah. Joe, I think there was a question there about later life opportunity. Sure, I mean, I, I actually did some work using one of the cohort studies a long time ago, seeing what happened when people got additional qualifications when they were older. I, can't, I think we found that it did make a difference but I can't, I'm just trying to sit here trying to rack my brains to see what we found. But this is, this is an important issue because I think, you know, 50% of the population or more than 50% of the population don't go on to university and they're exactly the group who we want to encourage more mobility because they tend to come from lower income backgrounds. So I think one of the, there has been a little bit more of an emphasis on vocational education recently. The problem is, is we can never quite seem to get it right. <laughs> so we fiddle around a lot. I know yeah. Paul's written about this. You know, we keep fiddling around with it. We never seem to be able to quite get it right in this country. So I think that, you know, it's right to think about that. And I think, you know, FE seems to be, I mean, things are not very good in HE, so they're kind of converging together a little bit more now <laughs> after years of underfunding no, for no, further... No, no, no. <laughs> oh, well, we're heading down. We're heading yeah, down. We've got a long way to go. Yeah, we have got a long way to go. So I, I think, you know, there does need to be much more focus on vocational education and on second chances. I would, I would completely agree with that. There's some interesting gender stuff, actually, with, with vocational education as well, because 
All the good qualifications in vocational education, the ones that lead to good jobs and high earnings, seem to be taken by boys. And we're not very good, and this is work by a colleague of mine, Sandra McNally, and, but we're not very good at providing very good vocational routes for girls. And um, white boys as well, I think. Yeah, and white boys too. So there are some inequalities within that system that we need to think about improving it um, over, overall. Did you want to add anything, Uta? <laughs> I think that covered it pretty much Fantastic. completely. <laughs> Last set of three questions are still uh, as uh, one, two, three. Thank you very much. That's not on. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you very much for a really interesting uh, panel discussion so far. Um, I guess my question was around uh, sort of immigration and whether that has an impact on social mobility, and in particular. I guess coming, the, the sort of rhetoric that we've been hearing from government recently is around sort of more uh, high skilled immigration, attracting global talent. Um, so I wondered whether that specifically sort of high skilled immigration, what impact has that had on social mobility within the UK? Again, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, just two quick questions. One, with regard to housing. It's clearly absolutely central. There's a huge amount, it seems to me, from what you've been saying, of correlation, causation, I think, you know, open for debate, perhaps, by you. But it seems to me also that since the 1980s, we've had a complete swing round with the cost of housing for people. It's gone from being a cost of accommodation to being an asset to be bought. And from that point of view, housing is both ever larger in terms of people's life chances, not just wealth, but the cost of renting, and that's particularly true of the current generation at the moment. Uh, we're talking about silver bullets. We've got a huge shortage of housing. Surely investment in housing in the public sector in a way that goes back to pre-1980s would make a massive difference in terms of the whole question of the wealth debate. That we need public housing, never mind about you know, bank of mum and dad in the private, in the private sector. That's the, so that's the first question. What's your view about a Can massive boost? one very quickly, so we're running out so, of time. And, and the other one is, it's just on the education and the time spent. Uh, and I was interested, Sam, that you were talking to people who said, well, whether it was talent or whether it was hard work. But I think one of the reasons people send their children to private school and trying to get them into the best university is the networking effect. I mean, actually, the highest the highest post in the, in the land, the prime minister, has been held by one school disarmingly frequently. And the reality is, to what extent can your research disaggregate, not just the question of, are you a better person because you've had the quality input time that Yuta was, calling, uh, was talking about at school, but to what extent actually it's the networks that you create at your school, at your university, that enable you to get the jobs, even if you're not quite as capable as the person who doesn't know that door is open to them. Thank you. And very briefly, if you will. Thank you, I'll be as brief as possible. This is for you to, I really like the five channels, but you only got to 50% or so, 52 for women, 54 for men, so there's something is missing. And I suggest that it could be time um, as a variable rather than just as a measurement quantity. And one of those channels, 100 years ago, investment in families, children didn't see their parents. That's changed, so has employment, and that's about to change again with the increasing AI. But I think the sixth, the sixth channel will be what the previous speaker has mentioned, that networking impact, which I hadn't thought about, and time will be number seven. Great, thank you. Um, last chance for all of our panels. I'll, I'll, this time I will come along, starting with, um, with Karen. Um, questions there about immigration and mobility. Do we know anything about the impact, particularly of high skilled immigration, and the importance of housing um, uh, more generally? Uh, Sam, perhaps you particularly want to take education and networking um, and, and background there, um, and a uh, question about time and the channels. But anyway, Karen, last, last words. Yeah. It's a good question about immigration, I'm afraid. I don't know the answer to that, so I'm going to duck that one, but it's a really good question. Um, on housing, absolutely, we don't have enough affordable housing, and that's partly a, a problem of supply, so we need to build more affordable and environmentally sustainable housing. There's also a problem with housing, with distribution of, of housing at the moment, because we have, I think, one in ten owner-occupiers actually own a second home, 
Um, and most of those, I and mean, some of them may be rented out, but many of those we empty most of the time. They're kind of holiday homes and, and so on. And some, many people have houses that are bigger than they absolutely need. So I think there is an issue about distribution of housing as much as about supply, and that can be tackled partly through taxation, which is why I talked about council tax, um, but other kinds of, of housing wealth taxes. But I do agree we need to build more affordable, sustainable homes. Yeah, thanks. Um, so just very quickly on the, ha the housing point, absolutely agree. And I think um, you know, in previous work I've done, when you're looking at how, how this type of stuff scaffolds kind of careers in, in professions, um, I think you, you also see housing is, is also very powerful in um, providing a platform for occupational opportunities, particularly in, in, in places like London where most opportunities tend to still be clustered. So I think it, it is both an asset, but it also has this kind of platform effect um, that's really powerful in, in shaping people's trajectories. The networking thing is, is key. Um, clearly, that's a, a really important element. I mean, what we can see in our data is the cumulative effects um, in terms of relative chances of reaching elite positions. If you pass through in certain institutions, the, the Clarendon schools, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and obviously a part of that is about the networks you, 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 you pick up there. I think, though, often what I think is actually happening is that there's a kind of uh, a cultural socialization that's going on that provides a set of touch points, um, a, a way of being that then allows you to be recognizable, um, perhaps not just in terms of actually knowing someone, but knowing how to be in certain types of environments where there are other people that have been through similar sorts of institutions and channels. Thanks. Just a couple of things. I mean, it's definitely true that we don't know enough about immigration and mobility. There's quite a lot of um, findings now that are showing how well children from different, although how well, how well children from some um, immigration backgrounds do in the UK education system and actually catch up very quickly and, and are very successful. And that's definitely like to feed into some earnings mobility. But what I thought is worth emphasising is the difference in the amount of wealth that's being passed on. So potentially, as earnings becomes a slightly less important part of this story than it was, that it means that catching up through education is not going to be as useful uh, in terms of your overall well-being as it, as it was. So I think that's something we need to keep a, a real um, eye on. I actually tried to capture some of these networking effects mm. a little bit because there were some questions in the cohort studies about, did someone help you get your job? Mm didn't really do much. Mm. I was very disappointed because I wondered whether that might be part of what was going on for the men. Mm. You know, what that extra direct effect was for the men. Um, I don't know. Maybe we're missing something, but we couldn't the, find it yet. I think those, those things are perhaps a little bit too, too crude in the sense of, you know, people are, and, and people are very conscious, I think, now of, 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 of nepotism, as, as the charge of nepotism. Yeah guarding against yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, I love, Sam's got this other great book where he talks about, you mentioned it very briefly there about people knowing how to behave in different environments. And the one thing you picked up there was that the environment sometimes is quite different. So the, yeah. the, skill, the, the skills you need can be, anyway, I like that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, we've got a whole session on housing coming up next, so I'll <laughs> defer all of, all of that discussion, but you're, you're going to be uh, very happy with, with what comes next. Um, <laughs> on the, on the, um, immigration point, uh, Joe was talking about the, the tra trajectories for those from different ethnic minority backgrounds, many of whom will be second or maybe third generation um, immigrants, and the fact that catch up in educational outcomes hasn't translated into catch up in, in earnings outcomes. So that's one kind of issue going forwards for, for earnings mobility. Um, I do know that in the US, actually, a, a country of otherwise pretty low social mobility upward mobility for migrants is actually pretty high. Um, so that's, I don't know of similar studies for the UK, but it's an interesting. We don't know enough about that, yeah. I think. Yeah. We yeah. need to look more into it, yeah. Yeah, so just briefly about what we're missing and in terms of uh, the time and investments. So there is evidence that, of course, the time that we spend with our children nowadays has gone up massively compared to the time of the cohort studies. So we might worry, given how important these investments are in generating social, uh, well, intergenerational persistence, that, you know, this might even be amplified if you looked at cohorts nowadays. Uh, in terms of other things that we might be missing, so what we didn't model here is, for example, occupational persistence. 
So your parents might push you towards, you know, becoming a doctor or becoming a lawyer or something like that, which might be one of the channels that we haven't modeled here. And then also in more recent work, we've looked at things like attitudes. So for women, for example, gender attitudes are actually quite an important determinant of their earnings. So for example, if some uh, girls at a young age already display, you know, more preferences towards, you know, staying at home and, you know, for more domestic work, this also then impacts sort of their life choices and their earnings as well. Well, I, I just wanted to say two things um, before wrapping up. One on, on housing, um, look, it's the easiest thing, well, at least part of it, that changing the taxation of housing is not difficult, at least in principle. Um, abolishing stamp duty on first owner-occupied homes is cost about half what the cut in national insurance, um, uh, the autumn statement cost, and we're much more beneficial, and we know exactly what we need to do with council tax, but consistently don't do it. Um, second thing I'd say is just an advert for some work at the IFS on, not specifically on migration, though there is some of that. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big chunk of the Deaton Review looking at um, ethnic inequalities and um, uh, related to migration, and we've just won a, and thanks again to the ESRC, a very big grant to do much more work on ethnic um, inequalities in education, in wealth, uh, in earnings, um, and in the labor market more generally. So look out for that over the next few years. Um, I'm sorry we've overrun by a few minutes, um, but there's still plenty of time um, for lunch. Um, Greg, where is lunch? Back, back where we had coffee this morning. Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, absolutely fantastic set of presentations and discussions, and thank you to you.